I haven't even preached yet. Come on. <laughs> you may not like what I have to say. It is great to be back home. Uh, you have no idea how good this feels. This is wonderful. It is so great to, to see familiar faces and get to know new ones. I was, as I was driving this morning to the church, I thought to myself, no, this is surreal. What year is this right now? I have a little less hair than I did when I was with you a long time ago, but it is great to be back with you. I tell you, this is a special church. I know many of you already know that, but this is a special church down to its very, very core. And Brandy and Paul and I, my gosh, we have been overwhelmed by your love and your welcome, the amount of cards and gifts. I'll be writing thank you notes for the next nine months. We truly, it has touched our hearts. I just had forgotten how much this church loves to love, and you do love to love. And that's what it's all about. Amen? Amen. And I want to say a special word about Reverend David McIntyre. What a man. Um, what, a, what a faithful servant of the Lord. I mean... I owe him big. He left me such a healthy staff in church. Amen. Glory be to God. <laughs> Some of you in the system know what I'm talking about, but it's just a thrill. I, he's been a mentor of mine for many years, and I, I have enjoyed his wisdom and relied upon him a great deal. And I just get to stand on his shoulders and enjoy a lot of the fruits of his labor. And I also want to thank my buddy, my hero, Dr. Riley Short. Um, if you don't like what I do today, blame him, because everything I know, I learned from that guy. But Riley, I love you, your brother, and what you've done for this church in the interim is amazing. I appreciate you so much. You have no idea. And I appreciate all of you. And I have some words I have prepared for you. Can I, can I share with those uh, for a little few, few minutes here? All right. Let us be an attitude of prayer together. Eternal God, we do thank you for the gift of this day. What a glorious day of worship. We sense your presence, Lord. It is alive and well through the music, through the prayers, through the fellowship, through the smiles. Oh, Lord, I sense your presence, and I'm so grateful for it. And now, Lord, you have given me the amazing privilege and responsibility of preaching your word to these my friends and your servants, Lord, a task I always need your strength in order to do. So, Lord, speak to me and through me in such a way that all of us do receive a word from you that will make a difference to our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, go Mox! <laughs> I'm a proud graduate of Florida Southern College. You know, I tell you, in the early service, it was a little daunting, though. Right on the front row was my former biology professor, and I barely passed his class. <laughs> now, that's humbling, but he still showed up today. I love Florida Southern. That's another reason why I'm glad I'm back in Lakeland to be reconnected to that wonderful institution, that great school. And I recall when I was an associate here, I was invited back to the campus of Florida Southern to be a guest speaker at one of Dr. Plowman's sociology classes. Anybody know Dr. Plowman? He invited me as a clergy person to talk to his class about Local pastors in the community, what our role is, how we affect the community. Well, I was really wet behind the ears. I had no clue what I was doing, but I showed up anyway. I thought I did a pretty good job. And at the very end, we opened it up for Q&A. And right as I opened it up, there was an eager student in the back of the class. She raised her hand high, and I said, uh, yes, ma'am. She said, why are you a Christian? I said, excuse me? Why are you a Christian? I mean, I'm taking this wonderful class on world religions, and there's so much beauty and truth in all these religions. I just want to know, why are you a Christian minister? Why did you choose to be a Christian? Let me ask you that today. Why are you a Christian? 
If you went out to lunch today and you met up with friends that didn't go to church or you got chatty with the, the waiter or waitress and they asked you, why are you a Christian? Why do you go to church? What would you say? Would your answer be convincing? I have to confess to you, there was a time when that question really haunted me, and I did not have a good answer for it. I've always grown up in the church. I've always been a Christian. But there was a time when I became a youth, and I began to think critically about my faith, and I began to ask the question, if I had been born in a different home, with my parents not being Christians, would I still be a Christian? Would I still follow Jesus Christ? If I had been born in a a Hindu family, would I be a Hindu? If I had been born in a Buddhist family, would I be a Buddhist? I mean, there are thousands of religions that are recognized in this world. What makes Christianity so gosh darn special? What makes Jesus so special? And maybe if some of you are honest, you've asked that question before, maybe you're asking it today. And you often wonder, yeah, if I had been born in a different situation, would I still be a Christian? If I had been born into an atheist family, would I, would I honestly still be a Christian? Maybe you had a professor that challenged you one time, or maybe you saw a documentary about world religions, and ever since then, you have questioned the validity of your faith. Or maybe you're someone in worship today, and you're just on the cusp of making the decision to follow Jesus Christ. But the one obstacle for you has been... Why Jesus instead of another religion? Well, this morning I'm going to tell you why. That's what I have prepared, so that's what I'm going to do. This morning I'm going to tell you why. After this message today, you will hear what I believe is the most convincing, the most compelling, the most penetrating reason why I follow Jesus Christ and why many people follow Jesus Christ. And for many of you who are on the cusp of following Jesus, this might be the tipping point for you because I believe this message could be a game changer for you. Because when I was on my quest during my time of critical thinking about the faith, through much prayer and research and talking to people I trusted, I came to the conclusion that I'm going to share with you today. And that conclusion was so monumental to me that not only did it allow me to make a recommitment to Jesus Christ, but it was very instrumental in my call to ministry, my call to preach Jesus Christ. So what makes Jesus so special? What makes Jesus so compelling? I'm going to let the gospel of John tell us today. I love the gospel of John because John doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't begin his gospel talking about the manger scene or the birth of Jesus. He simply begins his gospel by telling us why Jesus is so compelling and why Jesus' love and light is so life-changing. And he begins the gospel this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So what is John talking about? He's talking about Jesus. So why doesn't he just say Jesus? Because John is trying to tell us something very particular, very special about Jesus. Substitute word with Jesus. When you look at the word word, that can mean God's personality, God's essence. And so that means that Jesus Christ is God's personality on earth. Jesus Christ is God's essence on earth. And that personality created this world. And John continues, in him was life. And that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. That means God's light, God's personality lights up this world. You ever know anybody and you often say about them, well, she lights up a room. He lights up a room. What John is saying here is God's light lights up the world and there is nothing, not even darkness that can ever overcome it. But then John says this, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Here's the sad thing. Even though John talks about the light of God and the personality of God, he's telling us that some people will not accept it, that some people will not receive it, that some people will not embrace it. I'm going to tell you why in a minute. But then John tells us what happens when we embrace God's personality in Jesus Christ. He says this, Yet to all who did receive him, 
to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become what? To become what? Children of God. That means those of us who embrace God's light in Jesus Christ, that amazing personality, it is life changing. And how is that possible? And here it comes, one of my favorite verses in all of scripture, and the word became what? Flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. And there it is. And there it is. God's personality intersected human history 2,000 years ago. Now, God's personality, Jesus, has always been. But 2,000 years ago, God's personality intersected human history. So why did John say that some people never received it or understood it? Because we all know that God and Jesus came in a way no one expected. He wasn't born from royalty. He wasn't born in a palace. And why is that? Well, if God and Jesus had come in a high horse, he would have been intimidating. If he'd been born from royalty in a palace, he would have been unrelatable. But a little baby, a little baby born in a humble manner, oh my gosh, that gets to our heart, doesn't it? There is nothing more disarming. There is nothing more penetrating than a little baby. I can tell you that's true. For 18 years, Brandy and I were told we could never have kids. And so we resigned ourselves to the fact we would be the crazy aunt and uncle. Now, I'm still the crazy uncle, despite all that. But we resigned ourselves to that. Then one day, I was serving in St. Pete at Pasadena Community Church. And I come home from preaching. And I am exhausted. And I walk through the door. And Brandy has a really interesting look on her face. And she said, Charlie, I'm pregnant. (laughs) That's a good one, sweetheart. No, I'm pregnant. I've been to Walgreens. I bought 10 pregnancy tests, and they're all positive. I said, holy Moses. No, I said something else, but I can't repeat it in the pulpit today. I'm in 42, 43 years old, and my wife is pregnant. Oh, my gosh. But let me tell you. He has changed our world. Here are some pictures of him. I only have 35 to show you today. (laughs) Now, the one on the left, I want to tell some of y'all, I'm raising this boy right. That was like the second day in the hospital. He's in his deaf leopard onesie. And I'm in my deaf leopard shirt. Now, some of you come to know, I love 80s hard rock, the best genre of music in the history of music. I'm raising him right, and that's another sermon, all right? But when he was born, I, I tell you, I would have given you every, all the money in my bank account, I would have even, even given you my golf clubs, and they're tailor-made, and they're really nice. I would have given you anything, the joy of that boy being born, and it was such a touching moment. The first thing Brandy said when he was born, she said, we've waited 18 years for you, but now he's six. I'm 49, and he keeps me going. (laughs) But a baby has a way of changing things, doesn't it? I'll never forget, you know, after there was that time period when we had Paul at home, and, you know, for a while you can't take him out, you're not supposed to. Well, it came the moment we could take him out to dinner. We could finally get out and have a meal. And, of course, we're really wild. We went at like 4.30 to dinner somewhere. (laughs) And so our our where we sat was a booth next to a bar. We hadn't planned that. I hadn't taken my son to happy hour, but they just sat us right next to a bar. And of course, happy hour came and all these people show up for happy hour and they look all disheveled. You know, some were complaining about work. Some were complaining about their boyfriend or girlfriend. It wasn't a happy crowd. Well, through the meal, I decided to give Brandy a break and take Paul and walk him around so Brandy could enjoy her meal. Now, next to the bar, there was this window. You could look out and see all these sailboats and all this water. Well, I didn't even get to that window because the people at that bar just lit up. And I'm not talking about the liquor. Look at that boy. Look at that baby. Can I hold him? No, you've had too many. You can't hold my child. 
but their frowns turned into a smile. And that group at the bar that was so down and so disheveled and so upset lit up. A baby has a way of doing that. And think of this, baby Jesus did that for the entire world. Jesus lit up the world because that was the only way God could show us and God could express to us how much he loves us and how much he wants a relationship with us. That child had the most humble beginning, the most humiliating ending, yet the greatest impact this world has ever seen. Jesus Christ, it had to start like this, you see. So why is Jesus so compelling? What makes Jesus so special? Why do we sit here as this church lifting high the cross of Jesus Christ? Why did she take time away from maybe going to play golf or going out with friends to be here today? I'll tell you why. This is why. This is why it's so special. Because religion is reaching for God, but Jesus is God reaching for us. Religion is reaching for God, but Jesus Christ is God reaching for us. And that is exactly what I told that student that day in that class. This is the only religion that claims this. Only in the Christian faith does it dare to claim that God Almighty deigns to come search for us as the hound of heaven and as relentless as his love. And every other religion... People are desperately searching for the divine, desperately searching for wholeness. But in the Christian faith, a faith unlike any other, God Almighty takes on flesh for us to embrace us. And the question is, will we embrace him? And to be honest, for me, this is the only way I could put my arms and my brain around God Almighty. You know, some of you have heard the name Max Lucado. He's an author, doesn't have an unpublished thought, but he's written some pretty good books. <laughs> I don't know him personally, but he seems like a nice guy. But he talks about a, a time in one of his books when his family went on a vacation in the United Kingdom. And they visited this castle, and this castle in front of it had a labyrinth, you know, these, these kind of shoulder-high hedges, this maze. You know, think of the uh, closing scene of The Shining. Well, maybe that's not a good reference for a sermon. Anyway, <laughs> you get the picture, right? I got a letter on that one, you know. <laughs> but if you, if you navigated the, the maze properly, you were rewarded, Locato said, by getting to the entrance of this tower. And you could climb up the tower and see this, this beautiful view. Well, Lucado says, when you look at pictures, vacation pictures of the family, he says, I am missing from that picture from the tower. Why? Because I was lost in the labyrinth. He was walking around and lost. All of a sudden, he heard a voice from above. It was his daughter. Dad, back up and then turn right. Now, do you think he listened to her? You know how men are with directions. Did he listen to her? He could, have, he could have listened to other tourists and say, which way do you go? I don't know. Which way are you going? But he did listen to her. Why? Because she could see what he couldn't. And it's the same way with religion. It's the same way with faith. I don't know where some of you are when it comes to religion and faith. Maybe you're just seeking and you're like, I can't understand. There's all these opinions and all these choices. I don't get it. That's why God Almighty had to put flesh on to show us how much he loves us and who he really is and the purpose of our lives. Religion is reaching for God, but Jesus is God reaching for us. That's the only way that God, that we can find our way home, I believe. It's kind of like that carnival cruise. I don't know if you heard about it. This carnival cruise, a man fell overboard. And he was thrashing, and you could barely swim, and a bunch of people ran to one side of the, the boat to see what was going on and see if they could help. And some of them were actually Christians, if you can believe it, on a carnival cruise. And the first one to call out was the revivalist, and he loved leading revivals. And he called out to the man and said, I see that hand raised. Are there others? Some of you in the back are just now getting that. (laughs) 
The next one to call out was the Quaker. And the Quaker said, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to form a circle and we're going to pray quietly for your problem. And then the Baptist, well, you know those Baptists. The Baptist said, hey, buddy, that's the only way to be baptized. Good for you. (laughs) And the Presbyterian said, I'm sorry. It's just the will of God for you, brother. Then the Methodist, oh, boy. The Methodist called out, I'll tell you what we're going to do about your problem. We're going to form a committee and look at your problem. We're going to meet once a month every Tuesday at 7 o'clock and bore everybody to tears, but we just might find a solution. But then this, this ugly person that smelled showed up. Everybody was asking, how did this guy get on the ship? And he jumped out, swam to the man who was drowning, and brought him home. And the man, when the man said, who are you? He said, my name is Jesus. Jesus Christ is the only one who can truly save us. He's the only one who can make us whole. He's the only one who can give us purpose. I don't know what your problems are that you bring today, but I tell you, when it comes down to it, only the love of Jesus Christ, that is the love and power of Jesus Christ, that is the answer. Now, if that doesn't hit home to you, let me ask you this question. I don't know if you've ever been asked this question before. Can you imagine what this world would be like if Jesus had never been born? Think about that. You know, many atheists claim, well, the world would be a better place without religion. They just haven't thought through it, have they? Can you imagine what this world would be like without Jesus being born? I mean, his influence on this world is mind-boggling. No more Christmas. Kids, no more Christmas gifts. No more Christmas cards. No more Valentine's Day or St. Patrick's Day. But that's just on the surface. We would not value health care or rights for the elderly, or rights for children. I mean, his influence is unbelievable. Can you imagine this world without the Sermon on the Mount? Can you imagine this world without the writings of Paul? Can you imagine this world without the writings of St. Augustine and Aquinas? Can you imagine this world without all the art and books that have been influenced by Christianity? Can you imagine this world without Handel's Messiah? Can you imagine this world without the hallelujah chorus? Can you imagine this world without Oxford, Harvard, or Yale? That's right. Those were institutions first began by Christians to train Christians. Can you imagine this world without those who abolished slavery? Can you imagine this world without Bonhoeffer and those who went against Hitler? Can you imagine this world without the Red Cross? Can you imagine this world without AA and the 12 steps? Can you imagine this world without Martin Luther King Jr., where the call for civil rights began in the church? Can you imagine this world without the influence of Mother Teresa? But most of all, can you imagine living your life without knowing that God's love is accessible, that God's love is penetrating, and God's love wants a relationship with you, that God's love wants to make you whole? I mean, just imagine, those of you who follow Jesus Christ, what your life would be missing without Jesus Christ. And for those of you who are about to make a decision, imagine what your life is missing. Because I've said it before and I'll say it again. The love of Jesus Christ is the most powerful force in the world. And the only thing that truly changes people, the only thing that's going to change this world is the love and power of Jesus Christ. And if you ask me, Charlie, what is your vision of the church? What is your mission? What are you going to bring? It's very, 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 very simple. I am here to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ so all of us can share the love of Jesus Christ, to experience the love of Jesus Christ and empower people to share that love with this community and world. That's why we are here. That's why we exist. And here's the fun part. All of it's fun. This is the funnest job in the world. But here's the great thing. 
Once you are changed by Jesus, the fun part, I believe, is when Jesus gets into your heart so much that his relentless love wants to reach others through you. I come in for a landing with this. I'll never forget when I was in seminary at Emory, Chandler Bible College at Emory University, right? And my first year of seminary, we had, I was in what is called supervised ministry. We really called it supervised misery, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Basically it was this, if you want to be a, a, an ordained minister of the gospel, go and visit sick and dying people for a year and see if you still want to do it. It weeded out a lot of people. It was good. Well, I, I was making my rounds one day. It was the very beginning and I had no clue what I was doing, but I had a suit on and I had a badge that said clergy and chaplain, whoop de doo God's man of power and glory, I guess. So I'm walking around and this nurse says to me, chaplain, and I'm looking around for the chaplain. Yeah, what? Oh, me, that's right. Yes, I'm um, chaplain. What, what can I do for you? You see that man over there, she said, in the hospital bed, in that room? I said, yeah. She said, his name is Walter. And, and no one's come by to see him. He's not doing well. And I haven't seen anybody come to visit him. I said, nobody? She said, no one. Would you mind just going to visit him just for a minute? I said, sure. So I walked naively to the door. And before I got to the door, she said, oh, and chaplain, I need to tell you, Walter is a very angry man. Noted. So I walked into the room. I said, hi, Walter. My name is Charlie. I'm one of the chaplains here. He said, you are, are you? I don't need a chaplain. I certainly don't need God. Can't you see I'm dying? Get the heck out of here. And he didn't say heck. I said, well, you don't need a chaplain. Do you need a friend? Because I can be a friend. I don't need anything. Just leave me alone. And I started to walk towards the door. And before I got to the door, he said, you know, I, was, I wasn't always like this. I had a healthy life, a healthy body. And I slowly began to walk back to the chair next to him and just listened. Sometimes that's all you have to do is listen. And I just listened. And after he finished sharing, I said, Walter, do you mind if I share, I say a prayer for you? I don't think it'll do any good, but you go right ahead. And we closed our eyes and I prayed. And I said something in the prayer and I, I didn't plan on it. I just said, Lord, Cover Walter in your warmth and love like a warm blanket. Amen. And I opened my eyes, and I couldn't believe what I saw. I kid you not, there were tears coming down his face, and his arms were up in the air. And I, at first, I didn't know what he was trying to tell me or do. And then it dawned on me, he wanted me to hug him. So I wrapped my arms around his fragile body. Never forget this. And he began to rock me back and forth. Yes, Lord, cover me like a blanket. I had no control over what happened through me that day. But Jesus' love worked through me, and I became his blanket. That prayer became flesh for him. Religion is reaching for God. But Jesus is God reaching for us and through us. And that's why I believe in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, relentless, relentless Jesus constantly seeks after us and seeks others through us. Lord, we embrace your embrace of us. Lord, come save us, come change us, come make us whole. 
And most of all, come use us because this world is so desperate for the love that you came to give. It's in Christ's name we pray.